Hey, GW coming to you live once again. Hey, uh, this is Movie Talk Episode 3. And, uh, have you guys ever seen The Beast Must Die? If you guys haven't seen that film, I suggest you check that out. I just got done watching it. And it's a great mystery about a werewolf that, um, you know, was put out by Omnicus Studios probably around 73, 74. I believe 74. Anyway, the film deals with Calvin Lockhart, who is a millionaire, who invites a bunch of people up to his, you know, estate, because which one, one of them could be one of, one of them could be the werewolf, and there's different reasons in the film why. Now, it's a slow burn picture, but the thing that's interesting about this is there's a gimmick in the film toward the end, and what they do is they break into the film, and they give you a werewolf quiz and they tell you in the beginning of the movie you know stay tuned for the werewolf break and it's up to the audience to figure out who the werewolf is and when you look at the film you know you really can't tell i mean it's structured in such a way where you really don't know till the end but after you after the initial quiz is over and you figured out who the werewolf is there's a second werewolf so it's pretty interesting writing and I suggest you guys check it out. But like I said, slow burn movie, but it does make you pay attention. So on that note, we're going to talk about one of the Jaws, uh, the cousin of Jaws. We're talking about Roger Corman's cult classic Piranha. Now, if you guys haven't seen this, this thing was remade a bunch of times, uh, most recently in 3D. There was two of them. Um, and then once before that with William Cat. Now this thing did spawn a few sequels. But uh, the interesting thing about this. I was reading this book. It came with it. Basically that. Uh, it came in the middle of. You know the great sea terror classics as I call them. Because first it was Tintora Killer Shark in 1977. That was the first film. Mako The Jaws of Death in 1976. And The Notorious Great White. Now I want to talk about that film for just a second. Because that film was banned from theaters. Because it blatantly ripped off Jaws. And Universal Studios decided that they were going to put an injunction off of it. And basically stop it from being played. It was also known in the cult classic DVD segments as Cruel Jaws. I have a copy. Never watched it. I've seen snippets. It's really a cheap knockoff. Trust me. But anyway, Joe Dante and Roger Corman came up with Piranha. Piranha is about the, uh, the aforementioned fish. Basically, government-engineered killer fish. And they're developing this killer fish because they want to create a weapon of biological warfare. If that sounds familiar, you check your Resident Evil because they sort of picked that storyline up. Not with the piranhas, but just with the biogenetic engineering. Um, they terrorize a summer camp in this. And what's interesting in this film is that it leaves the kids wide open. Now, <clears throat> this does have a pretty all-star cast. It has Kevin McCarthy. You guys know him. He was on Invasion of the Body Snatchers and Barbara Steele. She was on the cult classic, the horror classic Black Sunday. And, uh... Belinda Belinsky, who was on The Howling, and Dick Miller. Dick Miller was in Gremlins. He was Mr. Futterman. But uh, you guys should check this out. And it's just noteworthy that it's been remade a bunch of times. I like the William Cat version, tell you the truth. I think he was an underrated actor. But um, Piranha, called classic. If you like Jaws, you know, and this is way before the Meg, you guys should check this out. This has a ton of stuff on it. It has additional scenes from the network. 
broadcast premiere. And what I like about the network scenes is that their scenes basically extended and not necessarily in the theatrical run. They put them in there just to either extend the scene or to play a different scene. It's funny, I just mentioned the Piranha remake. There was a scene in the TV version and it was a half a second scene and it was cut from the DVD. So y'all can check that out. But uh, Shout Factory put this thing out and uh, let's see. It's definitely worth checking out. Now, Roger Corman has done some crazy stuff. He did the Corey Feldman movie, Rock and Roll High School Forever. He did Humanoids from the Deep and Death Race 2000 with David Carradine. But uh, Humanoids from the Deep is the one I like. That's where the sea creatures come up from the, from the bottom of the ocean. They take women, they impregnate them, they stick them back on the beach. Basically to keep their light, you know, the creatures going. So Piranha is definitely worth checking out. Like I said, The Beast Must Die, I just watched that. That is probably one of the most smartly written screenplays I've ever seen. And I promised you guys we're going to talk about Waxwork. So we're going to pull that one out. And we're going to talk about this. Now this is a double feature. You can probably find this on Amazon on the cheap. Waxwork was actually smart and cheesy at the same time. And believe it or not, the lead actor is Zach Galligan. Zach Galligan, you guys probably don't know him unless you watch Gremlins. That was his key role. He was the lead character of Billy in that film. And he was opposite Corey Feldman. But uh, Waxwork is an interesting film. Because there's a museum that opens up. And the people that frequent it basically become victims of the Waxwork. Um, you can get in this place for free and it's pretty creepy. They have a little midget doing the, you know, introductions and he's pretty creepy on his own, right? And a group of teenagers goes missing in the waxwork one by one, but they become part of the exhibits. One notable sequence in here involves a werewolf knocking off the victim's head. There's the waxwork. You guys can see it. The only thing that's a little screwed up about this movie I'm going to move the camera so y'all can see that. One little thing about this film is that the second one is a piece of garbage. Just like most sequels, they didn't know what to do. Writers change. It's that and the other thing. It basically runs through time, and Christopher Lambert is in the second one, and I couldn't even make it the whole way through because I actually thought that the writing was stupid, the screenplay was stupid, but the first one had something going. As cheesy as it is, it actually was pretty cool to see some of these, you know, waxwork statues come to life and, and take out people one at a time. Um... Vestron Video put this out. Vestron was pretty good in the realm of horror for a while, especially in the early 80s, late 90s. And it, <laughs> I like the tagline, no movie you've ever seen can hold a candle to waxwork. But Zach Galligan's in it. He's also in the second one. And he plays along with Alexander Gundov. I'm sorry, Christopher Lambert was not in this. They all look alike. If you look at a picture of Alexander Gundov here, right there, he kind of looks like Christopher Lambert, so that was my bad. And like I said, I uh, I couldn't make it through the first part. And it was the first one was directed by Anthony Hickok. I don't know if he did anything else. Second one was written by Anthony Hickok, so I don't know what he was thinking. Maybe one day I will definitely try to get through number two. But the first one, it's original. I'm trying to think, because this thing was out for a while. It was 1988 when this thing came out. And I remember seeing the cover for this, and that looks pretty creepy. So I'm going to let you guys check that out. But yeah, definitely check it out. Check out Waxwork. It's pretty cool. And like I said, definitely check out Piranha. I want to talk about another horror film that people don't give much credit for. And it's called The Witch. And it came out, 
came out in 2015 and the reason that this thing is probably off the radar is because it was a slow burn film. It was a slow burn film in the fact that it was sinister, but not a lot of stuff went on. It was about a group of people in colonial America, one of them who is a witch, and you don't find that out to the very end, but um, it deals with subtle scares. You know, things start happening very, very slowly, and what you think really isn't what goes on. And you have to watch the whole thing to get it, because if you don't, you know, if you just say, okay, this is boring, you're not going to be in for a treat at the end. And it's funny because it starts out with a baby vanishing, which is always a great tagline for a start of a film. I can remember that movie Tentacles came out, I believe, in 1977. And the first thing you saw was a tentacle come up out of the water, grab a baby carriage and pull it down. But the movie dissolved after that. It should have been called The Two Dolphins Take on the Killer Octopus because it was boring, but it's still semi-cheesy, semi-corny, but you guys get the idea. Now, when this baby goes missing, the family begins to turn on each other because they think it's an inside job. Basically, you see their lives unraveling, and at the end of the movie, it is also a guessing game. And the end of the movie pays off if you pay attention. But it never got enough credit. In fact, when you say, what's your favorite slasher movie or horror film from 2015 the witch would not make the top 10 but i'm telling you guys it's worth a watch so that's that another one i want to talk about that's pretty cool and the ending that nobody figures out is the movie called the thing that's the john carpenter remake kurt russell now, this film did get a limited edition steel book and with a bunch of stuff, but I'm not paying $70 to get the thing. I mean, that's just no way. I went on YouTube, and the end of the movie still has people questioning it. When you watch it, you think, okay, Kurt Russell destroyed the alien. It's just him and Keith David sitting by the fire in the Arctic waiting to be rescued. But Carpenter had a better idea. Carpenter had a movie, or an idea, where the movie was not going to end like that. One of them sitting beside each other is the thing. It wanted to keep that sense of paranoia. But if you haven't seen this version, this is pretty cool. It sticks to the original 1954 film about paranoia. And it has some great effects. And Rob Botton is a genius. He came up with all kinds of grotesque imagery. But it also is a smart film. It doesn't just throw monster after monster at you. It actually keeps the tension going by, okay, if it's not this person, who could it be? Now, this is also a sequel. A lot of people don't know that. Because the movie The Thing came out... Just give me one second, guys. The movie The Thing came out in 2000. 2010 this is actually the first movie in the thing double features because at the beginning of this one you guys see a dog running across the arctic tundra and you just say okay that's just common this film shows you why the dog was running across the arctic tundra and then it picks right up into the kurt russell john carpenter deal um this is basically a rehash of the first film with a with a female lead who played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead, and she's pretty awesome. She handles a flamethrower pretty well, so we know she can deal with aliens. And it takes the grotesque imagery to a whole new level, but this film is interesting too, because you actually get to see the spaceship the Thing was on, and you never got to see that except if you played the Thing PS2 video game, or PS3, I can't remember. But anyway, that game was really freaking hard, and unless you knew what you were doing, you were pretty much done. So... 
These are both worth checking out, but check out the 2010 version first. It's put out by Morgan Creek, and then jump into the Kurt Russell deal. But like I was saying, the Kurt Russell deal had a different ending. And Carpenter wanted to have that sense of paranoia go through. And basically, it ended differently. So the question at the end of the film isn't if the alien was killed, was whether or not Kurt Russell's character was the, was the alien, or was it Keith David's character. That's worth checking out alone because it puts a whole new spin on the end of the film. So that's that. Also, I want to talk about one more film and why it's relevant today. And I'm talking about Wes Craven's Swamp Thing. Now, I want to tell you guys a memory about this. And I think this is going to become a theme in the movie talk era. This is a comic book movie, again. And it was written by Wes Craven before Nightmare on Elm Street, after Last House on the Left. Stars Louise Jordan, Adrian Barbeau, and Ray Wise. Now, if Ray Wise's name seems familiar, that's because he was Laura Palmer's father in the TV show Twin Peaks. Leland Palmer. And I'm not going to go in there, but if you guys, sometime I'll do a review on Twin Peaks, I'll tell you what I think. I love that show because, to this day, that promo scared the crap out of me. And if you don't know what promo I'm talking about, I'm talking about the fact that Whenever I first, whenever that was first aired on NBC or ABC, they showed a nice tranquil forest and they said in this small town, they showed a picture of the town, right? A very brutal murder has occurred. And the next thing you know, you see a body bag floating in the lake. And the tagline is something that a generation will never forget. It said, who killed Laura Palmer? That was pretty awesome. So, Ray Wise was Leland Palmer. That was the point. But this is about Alec Holland, who plays by who played Ray who, who is played by Ray Wise. I'm sorry. And Louise Jordan plays the evil doctor scientist Arcane. And Arcane wants the research that Alec Holland is doing. So what does he do? Like any comic book comic book story. He trashes the lab that, that uh, Alec Holland is working in, steals the formula, and he is going to use it to create mutants. That became a thing in this comic book. Next thing you know, during that accident, that lab takeover, Alec Holland is burned. A bunch of you know, experimental uh, stuff gets on him, and he becomes Swamp Thing. And at the end of the film, him and Arcane have a sword fight, and Arcane's dead. Or so you think. Now, the reason this is relevant is because DC Films picked this up. And I saw a thing on YouTube about it. And it looked pretty cool. It looked like they were revamping the original. Sadly, I just read that it was canceled. Production problems, script problems... And DC didn't really think anything about it. And Swamp Thing has been pretty much shuffled to the side since its inception. HBO had a half-hour show about this. It was picked up later by USA. And it was mild. I liked it. But no one else seems to, to no one else seemed to dug it, dig it. The other thing is it had a short-lived cartoon show. And again, it, it just, it didn't seem like anything was happening with this. But if you look for a good Swamp Thing movie or even want to get interested in it, I suggest you check out this one. Now, the reason this is relevant, and I can remember, this was on Late Night. I believe it was on Channel 11 or Channel 53. Any event, I sent my VCR to record it whenever I was little. I was staying overnight at a friend's house. And I was up all night because I couldn't wait to see this thing. 
because I had been hearing about it. Oh, a werewolf in a swamp monster fight. Well, when you're a kid, again, you you love monsters. Hey, let's watch this. So I ended up recording Halloween. Jamie Lee Curtis, Donald Pleasant. But this one was pretty good. Now, they did do a sequel with Dick Durock playing the title role. And it was okay at best. It was B-movie fair. Again, I think this is the first one that was actually good. And it also stores horror, horror icon Adrian Barbo. She has been in The Fog. She's been in countless horror films. But uh, this is where it all started. So if you're looking for a pretty cool film, check that out. Anyway, that's movie talk. And definitely, like I said, definitely check out The Beast Must Die because it was it's a very smart screenplay. And even with the werewolf quiz, which is a novel idea they threw in there, they used to do that back back in the day. They would have, you know, a spot and a break with the werewolf quiz, or they'd have some gimmick in the film, you know, of the 70s where you know, you're watching, say, a giant bug movie. They would have bugs drop from the ceiling. They would try to put you into the movie. And the beast must die. Even though it's corny, what you need to do with this film is get a bunch of friends and watch it. It also stars the great Peter Cushing. So if you're a fan of his, you might want to check it out. That's Movie Talk, Episode 3. And, uh... Tagline from now on is going to be, Hey, if it's a movie, we'll chat about it if I've seen it. And I'm not just doing horror. I mean, we're going to move on, but I know horror pretty well. But uh, definitely check Waxwork out for Zach Galligan's ungremlins-like role. And, uh, hey, we'll do it tomorrow. Definitely check out Piranha. And like I said, Cruel Jaws is worth checking out. You may be able to find that film online or at least read about it. I have a torrent of it. And it is so cheaply made, you could see why Universal put an injunction on that film. Also, you know, The Thing. Definitely watch that ending again. Because uh, when you read about what Carpenter really wanted to do in the unearthed deleted scene, it really puts a new spin on that, which is really uh, interesting when you go back and check it out. So that's that. Tomorrow we'll do episode four. GW, signing off.